Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Susan Checkelu Signan, Director of Marketing and Program Development for the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. FFRPL raises funds, presents programs, supports special projects, helps to create specialized spaces, and purchases supplemental materials and equipment for the Rochester Public Library. Welcome to Book Sandwiched In. We have an absolutely wonderful lineup this season, and we are delighted to be back here for this in-person program. We ask that you please silence your cell phones at this time. Our thanks go to those who help fund programs like these through FFRPL, the dedicated FFRPL committee members who curate and organize these events, our guest speakers and artists who graciously share their time and talents, the library staff who help with our setup and production, and the thousands of people who attend each year, both here and remotely. A bit of housekeeping, we are requiring advanced registration for BSI this spring. We do email the registration link to our subscribers and also post it to our website on ffrpl.org, where you can also sign up to receive our e-newsletters if you aren't already on our list. You can, of course, call or email us if you need assistance with the registration process. We'll continue to limit capacity in the room and have socially distanced seating for everyone's comfort. Masking is currently not required, but recommended in the library at this time. We will um, post the events with live, with uh, closed captioning, excuse me, to the RPL YouTube channel at Rochester Public Library, New York, about a week or so after each review. To access the induction loop in the auditorium, you set your hearing aid to the T switch. And we thank you for helping to make it possible for us to present in-person events while keeping everyone safe during the ongoing pandemic. It is National Library Week this week. FFRPL is having two book sales to benefit the library. You can browse and buy on our, at our on-site book sale just outside the auditorium. Today and for the rest of the week, you get two bags of books for just $3. And our online book sale runs on biblio.com through April 9th and you get 10% off of books priced $100 and up. And proceeds from sales here at Central and online benefit the Rochester Public Library. You can visit our website, ffrpl.org, for a list of programs being held in celebration of National Library Week, and be sure to visit Irigami's huge balloon dragon installation in Harold Hacker Hall just across the street. It's quite, really quite amazing. Today's review is of how the word is passed, a reckoning with the history of slavery across America by Clint Smith. Historian, anti-racist activist, and award-winning author Ibram X. Kendi says that this book frees history and frees humanity to reckon honestly with the legacy of slavery. You can watch Dr. Ibram X. Kendi's 2019 talk in Rochester, How to Be an Anti-Racist, via the link on our website at ffrpl.org. And we wanted to express our ongoing thanks to Dr. Kendi for allowing us to make his talk available for free to the general public as part of FFRPL's and the library's anti-racist resources, which include lists of other relevant materials, as well as videos of other archived, of archived events. Kendi's sold out talk in Rochester in 2019 was presented by the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, then headquartered at Central Library, and FFRPL and RPL sponsored that event. Our reviewer today is Windsor L. Wade. Windsor Wade is a retired history teacher with the Rochester City School District. He's a longtime supporter of the ACLU, the NAACP, and the Southern Poverty Law Center. He serves on the boards of Historic Geneva, Rochester Acts, and the um, M.K. Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Wade to our podium. Thank you for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? Uh, let me get my... It's been a long time since I've spoken to this many people. <laughs> I taught for 
35 years here in the city school district at a, at a very unique high school. You may have heard of, may have not, the School Without Walls. And uh, usually our class sizes are, we, we've got this great, great sign at the beginning of walking the schools, small schools are great schools. And our classes are no more than like 20, maybe 18 kids. And so this is quite a scene to see, 50 <laughs> people. <laughs> so let me get myself together here. Um, as you know, my name is Windsor Wade. And before I begin my talk about the review of this incredible book, just as Clint Smith paid respect to the indigenous communities upon which American slavery occurred, I too will do the same by reading a land acknowledgement for the indigenous communities whose land we now live on. And this wonderful acknowledgement was created by a dear friend of mine, Shirley Thompson, an activist here. Many of you, many of you may know her or may know of her. So this is my land acknowledgement to our indigenous community. We open this space with reverence and respect for the work we are undertaking by acknowledging that the land where we are situated is the seized territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which includes the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and Tuscarora nations. We pay respect to their elders past and present, and we'll take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence displacement, migration, and settlement that enable us to be here together today. We are encouraged to work towards friendship and partnership with our native brothers and sisters with a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration through such acts as getting behind the effort to change Columbus to Indigenous Day in our community, following the indigenous efforts to restrict destruction of land and life, and doing land acknowledgments to all the events and meetings where you are, acknowledging that have an action component on them. And I really felt compelled to do this because that's how Clint opens his book, acknowledging the indigenous people in which uh, American slavery occurred. In my teaching career of over 30 years as a teacher of history, I wanted my students to understand the complexity of our past and how that complexity echoes through to our present. As a student of history, I asked myself and my students, what was the purpose of studying history? What lessons can we bring from the past that can, keep us, can help us understand our present? It is said that the mark of a brilliant writer is the ability to transcend individual realities so that they might observe other truths. I believe that Clint Smith's book, How the Word is Passed, answers my before mentioned questions and marks him as a brilliant writer. The topic of America's slavery past and its continued impact on our lives today is what you might call a hot button topic, wouldn't you say? <laughs> So I'm going to begin this by having a quote from, oh, I can? <laughs> how do I do that? Ooh, how cool. <laughs> oh, that makes a whole different world. <laughs> Thank you. Now this is from Julian Lucas, who is a uh, um, book reviewer for the, for the New York Times. He says, and I'm gonna ask you a question after I read this. Where are we exactly in the great American slavery reckoning? Like a poorly written series watched only on random weeknights, it's beginning to lose coherence, even or maybe even especially when you pay attention. In one episode, protesters are tearing down Confederate statues, and the nation is on the cusp of reparations. By the next, the federal government has condemned basic education about slavery as a form of totalitarian brainwashing. 
The Harriet Tubman 20 flutters from season to season like an unresolved subplot. Are we in the backlash, the white lash, or the backlash to the white lash? And when will white liberals lose interest? It's enough to give anybody whiplash. <laughs> Especially those of us who, as descendants of the enslaved, can't safely stop watching the internal show. And I've been watching this show for 73 years. So folks, where do you think we are? Are we in the backlash? Are we in the white lash? Or the backlash to the white lash? What do you think? Anybody? Season one. Season one? <laughs> Back and forth. I know as a man of color, I definitely feel the backlash. And I, and I think that it's the backlash um, from the white lash. I mean, if you pay any attention to the news, this whole thing about critical race theory drives me crazy. I don't know about you, oh, yeah. you know, but uh, <laughs> um, truth telling is becoming very dangerous. You know, teachers are actually being fired for it. You know, and as Fannie Lou Hamer said so many years ago, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Okay. Um, it, as a former teacher and someone who I think I still am a teacher, um, I have to really be careful because um, anger is a good thing, but it doesn't accomplish anything. You have to, you have to temper uh, how you're feeling and take those feelings and put it into action. Okay? That's what it's all about. Uh, and not a, a, a knee-jerk reaction, but a thoughtful reaction. Okay? So, yeah, I, I love that. <laughs> it's enough to give anybody whiplash. <laughs> Doesn't matter what your race is. Okay. Um, so, where are we exactly in the great America slavery reckoning? And that's what this book is about. How is America reckoning with its slavery past? Um, so, this book, I believe, is a tour de force, which begins in Clint's hometown of New Orleans. Has anyone been to New Orleans? Great. It's, it's a wonderful city. Um, I mean, they, they, they do a great job of giving you a party atmosphere, but as Clint said um, in his first chapter, um, there are signs of, of its Confederacy past all over the place, the statues. And many of those statues have been removed. Uh, and, those, uh, and those statues had to be removed on the cover of darkness. <laughs> because people were coming out and defending that they should be there. Um, but I think he does, beginning in his hometown and ending in the epilogue, um, are you guys familiar with uh, Rick Steves? Europe, okay. I felt that I was with Clint, you know, in like a Rip Steves fashion, taking me from place to place and telling me um, to observe this and hearing these conversations. Um, I really felt that this book is so readable because, you know, Clint is a poet. And as my wife was reading it, she says, honey, this, this reads like poetry. It's prose, but it reads like, it's very smooth, you know. Are you familiar with Taya Nessie Coates? Okay, Taya Nessie's just like, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> you know, he comes at you, you know. And uh, I'm an admirer of him. But if you juxtapose the two styles, um, you know, they're both admirable and do wonderful work. Uh, but Clint's work, I feel, is, is something that endears you to what he has to say to you. You know, if you haven't read the book, once you start reading it, you will not be able to put it down. I guarantee you. No matter how s striking and harsh some of the things he says, but he says in such a manner that it compels you to continue his journey with him. Uh, 
Um, so I've visited New Orleans. I went there for Mardi Gras with my, my family uh, when my kids were about nine and 10, uh, which was quite an adventure because it's a body place. <laughs> and there were several times <laughs> my son said, Dad, why are those ladies lifting their t-shirts? <laughs> Hands over the eyes, let's walk down this street. <laughs> um, but the other place that um, he visited, uh, which is really incredibly compelling, is Gory Island. Okay, that's one of his chapters. Gory Island is an island off the coast of Senegal. And um, in 1986, I was part of a um, delegation of teachers from Rochester, sponsored by the Rotary Club, to go to Senegal and observe their educational system. And um, Gory Island was one of the places uh, which we went. And um, believe me, it is, you, it's, it's an eye, you have to take a ferry to get there. And then you go into these um, adobe style buildings and go down into the bowels where the captured Africans were taken to be put on ships. And it is, it's very subdued lighting, you go in and um, it's a room about the size of this room. And this is where they would put people until they got enough to put aboard ships. And it is haunting to know that that room was used for hundreds of years to hold folks, to put them into ship, to be put into perpetual enslavement, okay? Um, and in 1984, I went to Ghana. I'm surprised that Clint didn't go to Ghana too because Ghana has um, several of these uh, edifices and in one place is called Cape Coast Castle. The other one is Elmina Castle. And there is these huge stoneworks with the cannons facing out to sea. At one point in time, the Dutch held it. Um, I think the French held it, and eventually the British held it. And it used to be called Gold Coast. And Ghana is now Ghana, but uh, previously it was called the Gold Coast. And, um, the irony of, and, and again, these places are huge. Um, and at Cape Coast Castle, above on the roof is a church, is a chapel. You know, so while people are being held as captives to be sent into perpetual slavery, church services are held on top. So I'm, I'm surprised that Clint didn't go to Ghana too, but if you have an opportunity Instead of um, going to a resort in Mexico or traveling the Rick Steves route in Europe, take an opportunity to uh, visit Senegal, see the Gory Island, or go to Ghana and see Almina Castle and uh, Cape Coast Castle. It will change your life. Uh, let me gather myself here a second. So, um, unlike other books such as Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman, which focuses on the re-enslavement of black Americans from the Civil War to World War II, and Denmark Vesey's Garden by Ethan J. Keitel and Blaine Roberts, that focuses on Charleston, South Carolina. How the Word is Passed is a personal tour by the author about reckoning with the reckonings that we have to deal with. His personal conversations with individuals at each of the sites on the tour draws you into his personal observations and ask if you were there with, as if you were there with him. His interchange with Naya Bates, Monticello's director of African American history, and getting the word out history project uh, is a perfect example of, of how he, in his easy manner, draws people in these conversations um, 
And I want to read to you um, part of what that conversation was. Um, he had a conversation with a couple of women, Grace and Donna, previously to this conversation with Naya. He says, I mentioned my conversation with Grace and Donna. They came here, they bought a ticket, made a reservation, got up on a plane, rented a car, self-identified as history buffs, showed up and were like, I had no idea Jefferson owned slaves. I said, and it was such a fascinating moment for me because I'm like, you're not clearly not a non-curious person. You literally said, I'm a history buff and I want to see where Jefferson lived. I wanted to see Jefferson's house, but had no conception. How many people have been to Monticello? Did you know that it was a plantation when you went there? Yeah. Good. <laughs> oh, who he really was, right, Naya said. Not just who he was, I said, but even that Monticello was a plantation. Naya nodded. So many people came here without any understanding of the primary cause of the Civil War. Some people think Jefferson wrote the Constitution. I mean, there are just so many ways that our public education is failing people by not, just not giving them the context to understand that Monticello is a plantation and that slavery was a system that created the economic prosperity that enabled our country to exist. That is not something most people understand. I don't really blame them because they're not taught to engage that history and most people are not out here reading all these books that are piled up on my desk. That's a powerful observation. Anyone been to um, Mount Vernon? Did you know that that was also a plantation? Yes. However, Naya added, she has, no zero, she has zero tolerance, and I think this is beautiful, for those who, when confronted with that history, contend that Monticello is attempting to tear down Jefferson's legacy. It's telling the full truth of who he was, he, she said. Yes, he contributed great things. Yes, he gave us a Declaration of Independence and a university where I got my degree, but he also owned people. He owned ancestors of people I know. That's reality. I think in order to really understand him and to fully understand him, you have to grapple with slavery. You have to grapple with physical violence and psychological violence and family separation. We would not be doing the story justice if we don't tell those stories. This is what makes this book so compelling. When he brings those conversations in, these aren't his words, these are words of very notable, learned, concerned people to bring out the truth. Um, his easy to meet with strangers is apparent throughout the book. You know, um, I'm told that by my wife too. <laughs> I'll take a plane trip someplace and she says, how was your trip? I said, I met this most interesting person. Oh, you did, oh, really? Did you meet an interesting person sitting next to? <laughs> <laughs> It's really wonderful to engage with people with no pretense. And it's amazing how, what people will share with you if you just have an open ear to them. Um, the next part of the book I think is really intriguing is this chapter at the, the Blanford Confederacy Cemetery. That was just incredible. I don't think I could have had that conversation with that guy who came there to, to um, visit his dead Confederate relatives. Um, uh, Clint has a wonderful way of not being um, someone that can, sh that they'll shut you out. He was very open about hearing what people had to say. Okay. Um, in the Blanford Confederate Cemetery, he spent hours uh, with this person and this cemetery honors each rebel state with a Tiffany stained glass memorial. Um, and it gives you an example of a continued glorification of the lost cause, okay? He attends a memorial event at the cemetery sponsored by the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I find it interesting that he, 55 pages of this book is contributed to that part of his trip. And I think he spent more pages there that he wrote about than any other section, you know? So to me, it, it, it was really important that he shared that with that was conversations that he, that he had with these folks. Um, and I wanna share with you part
part of what he said, 156, conversation he had, okay? Oh, before, before I, I share this, um, I want to share a little, little thing that happened to me the other day. I live in, in Geneva, and one day I was in um, Pinyan, and um, my wife is a professional baker, and so she works for an artisan bake shop there in Pinyan, and I paid a little surprise visit, say hello, honey. <laughs> and so I, I went into the town, and I was uh, sitting on the bench, um, enjoying a little spring sunshine, and a pickup truck pulled up and pulled in front of me, and it had a license plate cover, and it said, um, um, heritage, not hate, and it had the Confederate stars and bars on it. And I was sitting there like, hmm, heritage, not hate, huh? That's an interesting way to interpret that whole time period. <laughs> so, two children ran behind me chasing a ball that began rolling down the hill. Jeff smiled as he watched them and dabbed his brow with a cloth before placing it back in his pocket. He told me that he does not call the country's deadliest war the Civil War because it distorts the truth. We call it the war between the states or of northern aggression against us, he said, because what they call the Civil War is not really the Civil War. Southern people don't call it the Civil War because they know it was an invasion. If you stayed up north, ain't nothing would have happened. And then he goes on um, to spend more time with him and this man telling why he feels the, the Confederate battle flag is misinterpreted uh, and that he feels that the Sons of the Confederacy is not a hate group. It's very, very interesting. Okay. Um, there are other parts of the book I would love to share with you. Um, but I hope, if you haven't read it, that you do read it, because there is so much to share. Uh, and again, I said his demeanor is one which really pulls you in um, to these conversations that he had. Um, the last part of the book that um, I'm going to share with you is the epilogue. Most of the time, an epilogue gives tribute and accolades and things. Um, it's not very meaningful, but his epilogue is incredible. Those of you who've read it, you agree with me? His epilogue is tremendous. And in my notes, I wrote, the epilogue is a powerful capstone to his monumental reckonings with the reckonings. And he begins by saying, and I think this is why this resonates with me. Uh, I, I took a trip with my wife to Florida uh, to visit an aging uncle of hers. And after we, we spent a few days at Tampa Bay, hanging by the pool and, and going to fancy restaurants, we hit the road and headed north. And um, I went to visit my grandparents' graves, um, one in um, Sarasota and the other one in Winter Garden. Uh, and then we headed north. And we, we wound up in Montgomery. And, um, and I stopped and I found my mom's father's grave in Eufaula. Uh, and once we got to uh, uh, Montgomery, we went to uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center um, Museum and um, just spent, it, it really, Montgomery does a great job of truth telling. There was ballards all over the town that were historical markers. This is where the ships came down the Alabama River and where the coffles of slaves were marched through the street. Here is a, a, a ballard that was a slave market. Uh, we were just blown away just how honest, and this is, you know, Montgomery, the, one of the birthplaces of the Civil Rights Movement. And we felt that Montgomery did an incredible job of, of uh, exposing its slave past. And, and truth telling. So, beginning of his epilogue, he says, my grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. They shared a, a name, a lineage, in the hard soil of Mississippi. My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. I thought about how I felt pulled closer to the center of the concentric circle of history. 
my grandfather's grandfather was a, a slave. I said it aloud and let it idle on the edges of my lips. So, if Clint's grandfather's grandfather was enslaved, for all practical purposes, so was mine. So what is in a name? My last name is Wade, which is an Irish-English surname. Some years ago, I did a National Geographic genealogy test and discovered that 18% of my DNA came from Northern Europe, Ireland, and England. My mother's grandparents, my great grandparent's surname is Mitchell, which is another Irish surname. This DNA discovery gives me, and much of black America, hmm, a complex relationship with this country. And I hope to someday discover where in my enslaved past my family got this infusion of English-Irish DNA. Uh, my wife has done incredible genealogy, and she has found the village in Sicily in, uh, in which her great-great-great-grandparents lived. I can't do that. In the middle, of the chapter of Gory Island, Clint says, there are gaps that exist inside me, a black man in America, unable to trace my roots past a certain point in history, whose lineage beyond the plantations where my ancestors were held remains obscured by the smog of displacement. There are the gaps that I'm trying to understand, the gaps I'm trying to fill. And I think for the majority of people of African descent, it can be said the same for them, to fill those gaps, okay? How many of you watched um, Dr. Lewis Gates' show, Finding My Roots? Isn't that an incredible show? The thing that disappoints me about that is the plethora of white celebrities on the show. And when I watch it, I say to my wife, wouldn't it be nice if every common person could have the same ability to find exactly where they came from? You know, I actually wrote a letter to him <laughs> and telling him those very same things. I didn't get a response. <laughs> <laughs> So, in conclusion, how's my time? Is good? I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so the, the last paragraph of the epilogue, I think, um, is probably so well written, and I hope it will be an inspiration for you to read the book. He says, the history of slavery is the history of the United States. It was not peripheral to our founding, it was central to it. It is not irrelevant to our contemporary society, it created it. This history is in our soil, it is in our policies, and it must too be in our memories. Across the United States and abroad, there are places whose histories are inextricably tied to the story of human bondage. Many of these places directly confront and reflect on the relationship to that history. Many of these places do not. But in order for our country to collectively move forward, it is not enough to have a patchwork of places that are honest about this history while being surrounded by other places that undermine it. It must be a collective endeavor to learn and confront the story of slavery and how it has shaped the world we live in today. And I will end my presentation with a poem by Adrian Rich. What kinds of things are these? There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill 
and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappear into those shadows. I've walked there picking mushrooms at the edge of dread, but don't be fooled, this isn't a Russian poem. This is not somewhere else but here, our country moving closer to its own truth and dread, its own ways of making people disappear. I won't tell you where the place is, the dark mesh of the woods meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost-ridden crossroads, leaf mold paradise. I know already who wants to buy it, to sell it, make it disappear. And I won't tell you where it is. So why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, you, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. Thank you.